Thank you for viewing our educational videos on micromanufacturing with lasers. In part three, Dr. Ronald Schaefer, CEO of Photo Machining, will describe a host of applications such as laser drilling, milling, and welding with an emphasis in medical device manufacturing. Over to you, Ron. Thank you, Rick. Today we're going to talk about some applications. The first application area that we'll talk about is the application area of medical device manufacturing. And within that area, we do a lot of things like cutting, drilling, uh, milling, marking, and so on. This section includes what we call medical devices. It does not include surgical applications. So surgical applications are something that's completely different and which will not be addressed in these series. So let's get into the medical devices. Currently, about 50% of all the medical devices sold worldwide are still manufactured in the U.S. And of that manufacturing capability, about 50% of the manufacturing processes are out outsourced from the larger companies to smaller companies. So this is a very good uh, application area for lasers for many reasons. The requirements and the trends in the medical device uh, fabrication stream include accuracy, miniaturization, repeatability, impact on material, post-processing, or hopefully the lack of post-processing, automation, traceability, cost reduction, and compliance. These are also the same sorts of things that you see in industries, for instance, like the aerospace industry. So first, let's talk about milling. Micro-milling examples include things like PZT grooving for ultrasound devices, um, grooving from micro, microfluidic devices, and you notice that there's an asterisk there. Mi microfluidic devices are actually a very, very big and growing field, and we think this is gonna be a very interesting uh, area for laser manufacturing in the future. Uh, most of this is done in exotic materials like glass. Some, of course, is done in plastic, but a lot of the microfluidics are done in glass, and this is a challenging material to work with for uh, other manufacturing methods. We also can work on micro machines, for instance, pumps like insulin pumps, uh, micro molds for injection molding, uh, lab on a chip devices, and also a host of different catheter operations, such as in this case, uh, in the milling case, the shaping of catheter tips. Some micro mechanical parts that we can look at include on the top left, a bioabsorbable stent that was processed with a 248 nanometer laser. On the upper right, we see a, essentially a small chromatography column where the material is polyimid and the streets between the mazes are about 10 microns in width. And those parameters were varied so that we got a good flow of liquid through the device and it's an analytical device for a pregnancy test. On the bottom, you'll see a small miniature gear that goes into an insulin pump this was cut with a laser in a plastic material. Uh, it is shown just as it comes off the laser, so there's a little bit of debris around the edges, which will come right off in something like an ultrasonic bath. And you'll see the size relative to a penny. Cutting. Lasers can also be used for cutting. Some examples include uh, the flat part OD and internal features. Uh, flat parts are very good to work with with lasers because you only need two axes of control. We cut a lot of things like gaskets, stents. Stents is a huge market area for lasers. Right now, the manufacturing is done mostly in metal materials, but bioabsorbable stents are fast becoming uh, available on the market. And we think there's a very big future for bioabsorbable stents. Metal stents mostly are made with lasers and mostly are made with red lasers. There are some lasers that are used that are ultra short pulse lasers, but when you get to the bioabsorbable stents, there's no question you really have to use an ultra short pulse laser because these materials are generally heat sensitive and that capability or that heat sensitivity will um, be a problem using infrared lasers. We can work on organic materials such as pig valves, uh, lasers you use to trim and also to clean different animal uh, membranes and valves and things that go into the human body. Lasers are used to make bone saws and connective plates for surgery. They're used to do tube cutting in many different ways. And they're also used for cutting of non-metals. 
So a wide variety of materials and part configurations uh, can be made with 2D, uh, for instance, CAD files, and also with 3D files if you want to do 3D multi-axis cutting. Tube cutting. Uh, we can do cardio tubes, neuro stents, surgical needles, many other different things. We can work with the tips, we can also put holes in the tubes, and we can also generate complex designs like you see in the stents. This is an image of nitinol stents. Um, many of the, for instance, stents are stainless steel, but there are also nitinol stents available on the market. And there are also some very crazy things like platinum and gold stents that I've seen. Most of these are done just to prove a point, but uh, in principle, they are compatible with the human body. These particular stents are worth them. We're done with a red laser with some post-processing, and the wall thickness is about 200 microns. The cut speed with a 10-watt laser is about 1.2 meters per minute. This view graph shows a few more stents, some of them in the deployed state, some of them in the undeployed state. And these stents are basically all made with lasers and are used in different uh, type of operations and they're stents that are manufactured by different medical device manufacturers. So, the polymer stent. The idea behind the polymer stent is this. When a metal stent is put into the body, it's pretty much there to stay. But unfortunately, in about 10 to 20 percent of the stent insertions, restenosis reoccurs within a few weeks. And when that happens, the plaque starts regrowing through the stent walls. At that point, you have an occlusion that can't be fixed with a balloon because you've got a metal stent in your system. So the metal stent has to be surgically removed before a repair can be made. Now, if you look at a polymeric stent, these polymeric stents are made to dissolve in the human body, which is why they're heat sensitive, and also, by the way, moisture sensitive. These are made to dissolve in a couple of weeks' time, which has been shown that the restenosis, if it does not reoccur within a couple of weeks, you probably stay. On the other hand, once these bioabsorbable stents disappear in the body, then if there are problems later on, you can simply put in another balloon, blow it up, take care of the problem, and put in another polymeric stent, and hopefully that will solve the problem permanently. So it's a very good method for uh, assuring that you don't have to have surgical follow-up procedures if there's any problems with the initial insertion. These bioabsorbable stents are made out of many different materials, but um, in general, they're all polymers. We want to have no cleaning or post-processing uh, with these stents. Uh, there should be no debris visible afterwards and no change in the material, color, or morphology. We can also cut hypotubes. This is an interesting application, and this demonstration shows a spherical cut made into a hypotube such that when you take the tube and pull on it, it expands into uh, almost like a little spring. The tube itself is about 300 microns in diameter, and the wall width is about 75 microns. So in principle, this thing is small enough so that you can just about fit a human hair into the open area of the original tube. And yet we can cut it very precisely with lasers without damaging the side walls and with also getting a very clean cut. We can also use lasers to cut non-metals. In many cases, the lasers that we use for cutting non-metals are different than the lasers that we use for cutting metals. So for instance, if you go to a laser job shop that has a variety of lasers, they can probably handle many different materials. So here's some plastic uh, drilling and cutting with the Exomer laser. 248 nanometers is in the UV portion of the spectrum and also gives very clean results. By the way, the pulse length of these Exomer lasers is on the order of about 20 nanoseconds, so it is a nanosecond laser, but it has high energy per pulse and short wavelength, which gives us the capability to get a very high peak power intensity, which as we saw earlier is uh, key for uh, clean low taper processing. On the left hand side we see about a 20 micron hole in a molded device and this is for drug delivery. There's no way that you can get a mold that will have a hole small enough to have, be about 25 microns. So we mold things or they mold things without the hole and then in a subsequent step the laser hole is molded in or is drilled in. And these parts are done on the order of hundreds of thousands per month in an automated uh, fashion using uh, either an Exomer laser or a 266 nanometer uh, nanosecond DPSS laser. In the middle you see some square features. 
Uh, with the Exumer laser, it's very easy to make square features because we actually image a mask on target. So if you want a round hole, we use a round mask. If you want a square hole, we use a square mask. And the holes that you see there, or the square holes that you see there, are on the order of a couple hundred microns on a side. On the right-hand side, you see some 3 mil mylar that's been processed with a UV laser. And this is a flow-regulating device that's used in a medical breathing apparatus. Laser drilling, this is probably the biggest application for lasers in micromachining, drilling holes for a host of different things. Um, in this case, we're going to look at medical parts, so we're talking about drilling holes for drug delivery, uh, drug delivery in catheters, drug delivery in angioplasty balloons. We're looking at drilling holes, very small holes, for inhalers, uh, for instance, for insulin dispensers. And the hole size has to be regulated very closely for things like uh, breathable insul insulin because the insulin that gets through has to be large enough so that it's actually captured by the lungs and not expelled in your next breath, but small enough that it can actually be dissolved by the lungs. So there's a very um, tight tolerance range of what these holes can actually be in order to make the devices work. We can drill holes in connective plates for screws, uh, drill holes for flow cytometers, for flow regulators, um, and for micro filters. Micro blood filters are a very big application of laser technology. So, another application area is laser welding and brazing. Laser welding is generally done with infrared lasers. Infrared lasers are heat lasers, hot lasers, and for these joining applications, that's generally what's needed. We use these welding technologies uh, quite frequently in things like endoscopes, uh, endoscope manufacturing, a very, very high um, usage in pacemaker manufacturing. Uh, by the way, about 80% of the pacemakers in the world are made by Medtronic. We can also me weld things like plastics, which are very difficult to do with uh, other technologies. Um, perhaps ultrasonic welding and maybe a few others exist. But we can use lasers to, absorb, to weld plastics if one of the layers is absorbing and the other is transmitting. If that's not the case, then we can use even two transmitting layers by putting a uh, absorbing layer of uh, something in between those two layers. Uh, also, there are demonstrations that show that if you very, very tightly focus between the two layers of even essentially non-absorbing material, that you can get a good weld. And this is done primarily these days with two micron wavelength lasers. So there are many different applications for welding in the laser, or laser welding in the medical device uh, arena. Battery manufacturing is a very, very big user of welding because in batteries, there are many dissimilar materials and lasers excel more so than other technologies at welding dissimilar materials. Welding is also used in things like neural stimulators where a probe is put into the brain and then this um, helps to alleviate conditions such as Parkinson's disease. They're also used in defibrillators, pressure sensors, are another area where welding is uh, quite frequently used. So, thank you everybody. Thank you, Ron, and thank you for viewing Laser Applications. In part four, Ron will present additional industrial applications, including laser marking, patterning, surface texturing, and some unique applications such as laser additive manufacturing. Visit photomachining.com for more information.